Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Zion Fairwater. Hello to everyone joining us uh, online. We're glad to be together in whatever way possible. We will have announcements later on in the service, so at this time, will you please stand for a brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that, attentive to your word, we may confess our sins that receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We pause briefly to have some time to reflect. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please remain standing for our entrance hymn. <laughs> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison.
be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the scriptures. Our first reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 1. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry, so one of the men who have been accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barnabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take place, the place in this ministry and about apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. And there first reading. The second reading is from the book of 1 John chapter 5 verses 9 through 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. To those who believe in the son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who did not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given him concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know what you, that you have eternal life. Here ends the second reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Before I get started with this reading, maybe you can tell by the way it's laid out in your bulletin or maybe even on the screen that it's laid out kind of strange. And that's because the writer of the Gospel of Luke, a guy by the name of Luke, ironically, Luke wrote two books, Luke the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts. And today we're going to be hearing the story of Jesus' ascension. So I'm going to read to you out of book one, and then I'm going to go right on in to book two for a second way that Luke describes the ascension. We begin in ch uh, chapter 24, verse 44. 
Then Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Book two. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given the, given the commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them, he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when Jesus had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him away out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. St. Luke's interpretation of the gospel. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Do I have any kids that want to come forward? Spend a little time with me? Hey there. I wish I could do that. Hey there. So I understand um, today was the last day of Sunday school, and you had a bit of a party. Mm -hmm. Did I understand right? Yeah. What was that like? There were a lot of balloons and a lot of balloons that popped. A lot of balloons that popped intentionally? Were you sitting on them? No. No? Yes, that was really Okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. Well, if you had an end of Sunday school, what's that? Hide and go seek. A church is a great place to play hide and go seek, isn't it? So many places to hide. Well, if this was the last day of Sunday school, how about if we do like a rundown? Tell me what you've learned about Jesus. So tell me, anybody tell me where Jesus was born? Jerusalem. Jerusalem? He wasn't born on a cross. Hang that thought. Hang, hold that thought. Where was Jesus born? Jerusalem. Jerusalem? Nope. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. What were you going to say? Were you, I thought you were going to say in a barn or in the manger. Okay. After Jesus was born and he grew up, 
What is something Jesus did when he was grown up? He turned water into wine. What else is something Jesus did? He walked on water. He walked on water, yeah. That would have been cool to be with him, huh? What? Jesus is not the one who parted the water. God did that. And that was way back in the Old Testament. But that's a good guess. I'll bet you you had that story this year. What's something else Jesus did? If Jesus came across somebody who was sick, what might Jesus do? Jesus healed them. If Jesus came upon somebody um, like a woman who was naughty and... uh, um, Do you think he would have made fun of her and thrown stones at her? No, what would Jesus do to somebody like that? Yeah, he did. He included her, welcomed her, helped her. And how did that make people feel about him? He could do more things. Some people thought that was very good what he did. But what about like the rulers and the temple priests? How did they... They did not like it because Jesus was breaking rules left and right in order to help people. So what did... You can't break the rules. All right. There you go. Uh, So what, um, what did those rulers and those temple priests do to Jesus? They crucified him on a cross. Yeah. That's what we were going to say. You know, like like crucifixion wasn't bad enough, but before they did that, they killed him. They beat him. They spit on him. They were horrible to him. They made him drag his own cross. Made him drag Yeah. So then what happened? Then they nailed him to the cross. Nailed him to the cross and killed him. But then he laid on them, and a couple days later he woke up from the dead. Woke up from the dead. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, so they killed him. They put him in a tomb, sealed that tomb with a big fat stone. That didn't stop him. He rose again. Now the big question. What happened after Jesus rose again? He got killed again? No, not really. Say it louder, Junie. He ascended into heaven. I just read that story out of the Bible. So they killed him. He died. He rose from the dead. And then he went into heaven. So where's Jesus now? In heaven. Yeah? Oh, I see over us. You think? Maybe he's on earth? Whenever we do something that Jesus wants us to do, he lives in our hearts. He lives in our hearts. And that tells the whole world that Jesus is alive because we are doing the work that he came to do. When we are kind to people who are sick or who nobody wants to play with or whatever, Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. So if we want Jesus to be alive, and who doesn't want Jesus to be alive, then we do the things he did. We love others, we help others, and we tell others about who Jesus is. So I want to thank you for coming up here, and is there anything in here you want? Please take. Oh, I love your dress. You can have whatever you want. If you're not already jacked up on sugar enough, here's some more.
Jenny, we're just about empty. <laughs> The Ascension. I always imagine it was a beautiful day. After all, why would Jesus and those disciples, recently reunited after a terrible, terrible experience, be out walking in the countryside if the weather was bad? I imagine that more than just a blue sky, there must have been a soft breeze coming off the Sea of Galilee. Wild flowers were blooming wherever they looked. It was a day of starting over. Finally, getting back to the way things used to be before all the recent and horrible events of Lent had taken place. They lived through political controversy, Jesus' arrest and torture, a violent crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. These are not just experiences that people get over. I'm sure each of those disciples carried their own horrifying memories. The trauma, the fear, the anger, and the regret over what they lived through in the preceding weeks. Now, unlike most humans who grieve a death, however, Jesus' disciples must have felt like they had won the lottery. They lived through it all. They carried their heavy, heavy regrets until, unbelievably, Jesus rose from the dead. What they had been promised had come true. Love was greater than evil. Jesus was the Son of God. God could overcome anything, even death. And now, as Luke recounts the story, Jesus finally was walking with them again up and down the rolling hills of Galilee with the breezes blowing and the sun shining. The disciples listened to Jesus preach that day, not really understanding him, but then again, there's nothing new about that. I imagine they nodded appreciatively and just thanked their lucky stars that things were back on track. And just like they remembered, there was a time that afternoon that Jesus would stop preaching and they could ask their questions. And when that time came, they took the opportunity because as you can well imagine, they had so many questions. When, they asked, when would this kingdom you talk about come to be? It was a reasonable question, considering everything they had been through. They wanted to know. Now that you'd shown the Roman rulers who's boss and put the leaders of the temple in their rightful places, when is all that you've been talking about going to take place? When will you become the guy in charge and all of us, your faithful followers, distinguished members of your cabinet? When? We saw you conquer death. What more could be left? But as they asked these burning questions about when all this would come to be, Jesus answered them by saying something about being his witnesses to all the world. And as he said that, he started floating up, rising to the sky, away from them, away from them again. What was going on? You can imagine their confusion and perhaps downright terror 
They lived through the crucifixion against all odds. They were ready to follow him whatever was next. And then, then he went away, away. Unbelievably, those disciples stood there on the hillside in Galilee, cupping their eyes, staring up into the bright, brilliant sky, trying to understand what Jesus was up to now. And then he was gone. Where did Jesus think he was going? Just as the tide had started to turn and their political hopes were rising. Where did he think he was going after all the grief and pain they had all experienced? How could he leave them after all they'd been through? Luke uses the ascension to begin his story of the first Christian church. And he tells the story in his second book, the book of Acts, in the form of a letter to his friend and student, Theophilus. Luke starts with this story because that emotional image of the disciples crowded together on that mountaintop, staring as Jesus went away. Well, isn't that a lot like how we're feeling? How modern day Christ followers are wondering where Jesus is and what he's doing? It's a question that must be answered over and over and over again with every generation who embraces the Christian message. You know, we often talk about heaven like it is the best all-inclusive resort we can imagine. We pine for a heavenly reality that is totally different than the one we're living in right now. We long to grab the hem of Jesus's robe floating up to the sky to a place where all of our worldly problems just disappear. And because we love to join the disciples in this dreamy heavenly focus as an organized church, as an institutional expression of what Jesus came to teach us, we neglect what's going on here right now on earth. After all, what's the point if we're all just going to go up to heaven sometime soon anyway? When the day of ascension had come, Jesus led the disciples to the top of the hill and was talking to them about this elusive, strange concept that he always was talking about the kingdom of God. And for those first disciples, it took two angels, two, that some of them had seen in the empty tomb, but it took two angels to descend from the sky to tell them plainly that standing around staring into heaven was not going to bring about the kingdom that Jesus had been describing this whole time. The angels first told the disciples that it was time for them to stop. Stop just standing there. Stop cowering in fear. Stop running for cover. Stop denying that they knew Jesus. Stop pretending they didn't understand when Jesus asked them to step up. Why are you standing there looking up to heaven? Don't just stand there. Do something. Now, for us modern-day disciples, we are far too sophisticated to stare at the sky looking for angels. So the same instructions could apply to us. When will we really grab hold of the power, the infinite power of God given to us? When will we come to believe that he truly has risen and he already 
has forgiven us. When will we start to live as though love truly is our most important commandment? And to love not just those we already love, but to love like Jesus, even those who denied him, who betrayed him, who even killed him. Jesus believed all of these were worthy of love. Just like the first disciples, we are often at risk for forgetting that Jesus' invitation to love one another didn't end just because Jesus ascended into heaven. See, love is the very foundation for the kingdom of God to be built upon. The Ascension is a very strange way for Luke to start the story of the first church. Yet it is a story of love. Jesus loving so, his disciples so much that he returned for them. And through that, Jesus encouraged them to pass on the love he gave them by forming a church, a place where love could be shared and multiplied. And you know, when you come to think of it, this is not the only story about Jesus that starts out so strange. Pretty much everything about Jesus, God coming to earth, being born in a barn, is completely framed within the unbelievable, the unlikely, the miraculous. You know, the core of Jesus' message turned everything we knew and expected on its head. Jesus taught what it meant for us to be church and what God's unconditional, totally forgiving, non-judgmental love looked like. It welcomed strangers. It fed whoever was hungry. It loved enemies. Jesus said that when the kingdom started to come, those who weep would dance for joy and the oppressed would experience freedom and those who lived crippled with an absence of hope would begin unbelievably to anticipate the future. You know, Jesus didn't rise from the dead to prove he was more powerful. Jesus didn't ascend to prove that God was bigger or better than any other. Jesus didn't return to seek revenge. Jesus died, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven because God loved us that much and wanted us to live in this kingdom. And God believed that we could carry on his son's work of loving others. You know, Jesus loved when it wasn't easy, when it wasn't convenient, or even when it wasn't pleasant. Jesus continued to love, even when it was unbelievably hard. Jesus just rose above all the hatred, all the anger, all the demand for punishment and fear, not so he could look good, so that every one of us could be loved and forgiven and together in the kingdom forever. As those disciples turned away from that clear blue sky, swallowed their fear and set out to start bringing the kingdom that Jesus taught, they started to create a very tangible way to remember Jesus and his teachings the church. The question for us then is the same question those disciples faced that day. Jesus has risen, returned to earth, and ascended. Now what? <coughs> Excuse me. We are given these moments these reminders as we share our church calendar, our church activities, our scriptures together 
to remember the importance of showing up as a church that's founded by God. The truth that Jesus has risen and ascended into heaven and that God's love is more powerful than any mortal act, including death. What do we do with that? How do we embrace that kind of joy and love and trust that Jesus' ascension invites us to live? As we celebrate the ascension, perhaps we could all do a little bit more of that commandment that Jesus taught that his resurrection was all about. Stop just staring up at the heavens and get out there. Create the kingdom Jesus started. Love one another. Amen. Please join in singing our sermon hymn. Please stand as you are able, as together we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten, God from God light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made a man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, glory, to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, and glorified, which he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today for the prayers, we have a special litany of women. Spirit of life, we remember today the women named and unnamed, who through time have used the power and gifts you gave them to change the world. We call upon these four mothers to help us discover within ourselves your power and the ways to use it to bring about God's kingdom of justice and peace. We remember Sarah, who with Abraham answered God's call to forsake her homeland and put their faith in a covenant with the Lord. We remember Esther and Deborah, who by acts of individual courage saved their nation. We remember Mary Magdalene and the other women who followed Jesus who were not believed when they announced the resurrection. We remember Phoebe, Priscilla, and the other women, leaders of the early church. We remember abbesses of the Middle Ages who kept faith and knowledge alive. We remember Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena who challenged the corruption of the church during the Renaissance. We remember our own mothers and grandmothers whose lives shaped ours. We pray for the women who are victims of violence in their homes. We pray for those women who face a life of poverty and malnutrition. We pray for the women today who are firsts in their fields. We pray for our daughters and granddaughters, for students and co-workers. We have celebrated the power of many women, past and present. It is time now to celebrate ourselves. Within each of us is that same life and light and love. Within each of us, lie seeds of power and glory. Our bodies can touch with love. Our hearts can heal. Our minds can seek out faith and truth and justice. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us turn to one another and share a sign of God's peace and love.
may be seated for the announcements. So just a couple of announcements. First of all, happy Mother's Day to all who offer nurturing care. And um, that may not mean you had a child, uh, but we give thanks for the loving, nurturing care that you give. Uh, just a few notes here. The Bible study group that meets on Wednesdays has decided to go on hiatus for the summer. Too much gardening work, I guess. So uh, we'll um, take that off the calendar for now. Council members, hopefully this is not a surprise to you, but this Wednesday we have council meeting at 6 o'clock, unless I got it wrong on my calendar. Am I right, Bonnie? Okay. Um, please note, next Sunday we'll have a little bit of a celebration uh, for Jen Digman, uh, not Jen, for JC uh, Digman as we honor those who have graduated. And also, um, if you know of somebody who's graduated from college or some other institution, please let me know so we can honor them as well. I ask for your prayers this week as I will be the chaplain at the Synod Assembly. And so I've come down with a cold. What a great way to start that out, huh? But um, our, I will be gone from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and uh, we're going to be doing the work of the church. So please, I ask for your prayers. Those are all of the announcements that I have. Are there any others? Very well, then. Let us present our offerings to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, holy God, through Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to his disciples and in their sight was taken up into heaven that he might make us partakers of his divine nature. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. You are welcome at this table. Please note if we have any visitors here today, that our, ble our bread is gluten-free, nut-free, and dairy-free, so it is safe for all to consume. The congregation may be seated, and would the communion assistants please come forward.
the congregation please stand for the blessing? And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. And now receive the final blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Friends, how good and pleasant it is to be together, in person or in spirit, encouraging and consoling, provoking and inspiring. But now our service has ended. So now the wider service begins. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Go in peace into the world for the love of the world. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. 